Okay. <clears throat> so uh, welcome everybody to uh, the panel on fair value uh, accounting and the crisis. And thanks to uh, both Peter and Trevor for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, chair the session. Um, this is obviously one of the most contentious uh, accounting issues uh, of recent years. And therefore, we thought in the sort of conception or thinking about the panel to leave plenty of opportunity for us to have a discussion to bring in the audience. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, I will just very briefly mention that we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, and um, let me just say that we're very fortunate to have uh, Andrea Betzold, who uh, has plenty of practical experience, both as a lawyer, auditor, and banker, and has also uh, dabbled into uh, regulation. Um, then we have Jeff Burks, who is, has done research on the issue, Dushant Vyas, who's, who's done also research, and they both will share their research papers with us. And then we have Stephen Ryan, who's been, uh, is one of the foremost experts in sort of bank accounting and has also worked extensively on fair value issues, and we'll go in that order. Um, let me also say that there's sort of two experts that are uh, not on this panel. Uh, the uh, first, uh, Urush Khan, was supposed to be on the panel. Unfortunately, he's stuck in India because of visa issues, which is very unfortunate. And then secondly, uh, Peter and Trevor also tried to uh, invite Ashton Kutcher, uh, <coughs> who's also an expert, but he declined and uh, just sent us his, uh, his this is the, an actual tweet, um, <laughs> tweet analysis and, and regrets because he has to do another movie. Uh, so more seriously, um, Fair value accounting has been claimed uh, to have exacerbated the crisis, not according to Ashton, but uh, most other people. Um, and in particular, there's three arguments. One is that the argument that there's excessive leverage in booms. The sort of second contention is that there's excessive write downs in the bust and that these write downs set off a downward spiral. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with that argument. And then thirdly, it just doesn't lead to a downward spiral for an individual bank or financial institution, it can also lead to contagion because the marks or the, the fire sales of uh, other banks become marks and then uh, it sets off the process for the next bank. Now, the question that we want to debate here a little bit is did fair value accounting actually contribute to the current crisis? And despite sort of the popular claims and conventional wisdom, we really want to talk about specific evidence and, and uh, and, and that's often uh, not provided, and so that's why I think we're fortunate to have sort of some of the uh, evidence on this issue here on the panel. Um, just to sort of lay out a little bit the lay of the land or, or what I think the challenge is in identifying whether fair value counting played a role, uh, market prices are, are used in many places. And so it's not just in fair value accounting. There's collateral and margin requirements. There's value at risk techniques. And it's easy to confuse the use of market values in these techniques with fair value accounting or a role of market values in fair value accounting, but they ha in my mind, they have to be uh, uh, kept separate. Large losses obviously cause problems for banks, but the question is, did, does fair or did fair value accounting um, exacerbate these problems, and would these problems have occurred otherwise? And then I think we also need to talk about the alternative, right? So uh, we would have said, would historical cost accounting been better? And important is to note that impairments under historical cost accounting would, could potentially set off similar effects than the write downs under fair value accounting. And again, we have to ask would the markets have reacted differently uh, if the banks had not recorded the losses, which I think is an important question. So, just to illustrate that, when a loss occurs and then the fair value accounting or the bank reports the loss and there's certain actions taken, the question that we, sh we need to ask is would the actions have taken place, you know, even if the, um, would the action have taken place regardless? And if the actions would have taken place regardless, then I think it's hard to fault fair value accounting as the, the culprit or the problem. Similarly, you know, procyclicality is sort of the, a, a new you know, buzzword that, that plays a role for accounting. But again, there's many sources of procyclicality. The market value-based uh, management of banks, again, the value at risk techniques, haircuts, margin requirements, collateralization requirements, all of those can lead to procyclicality. Now, and because of that, what that means is these arrangements could force the banks to actually raise capital or sell the assets and set off these spirals. But the question is, you know, again, are these spirals that we see, are they the result or the consequence of fair value accounting? Um, 
And so what are, I think when we want to talk about procyclicality of fair value accounting, what we need to talk about is whether fair value accounting contributes something over and above the cycle or over and above what these other arrangements would do or in conjunction with these arrangements, which is sort of what I'm trying to indi uh, indicate with this little graph here. Um, so in my mind, what it takes, and then I'll turn it over to the panel, is that we need to identify and be explicit about what the links are through which fair value accounting causes the problems. We need to talk about, you know, is it the link to capital regulation? Is it the contracts? Is it some accounting fixation by the investors, the rating agencies, or the bank managers? Where are the links that are causing the problems? And then it's, even if we're sort of recognizing these links, the next step is then to recognize that fair value accounting as stipulated in GAAP, and the same can be said for IFRS, includes various circuit breakers. So even if you identify sort of links and problems, the next question is, you know, did the circuit breakers, if they, you know, uh, th that are in place, did, could they mitigate the problem? And then, you know, if they can, the question is, did they actually work in the crisis? So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Andreas and uh, get the panel started. Thank you, Christian. Um, before you come to the research presentations, I want to put something in front of the bracket, so to speak, because the research is very difficult on this issue. So many factors can play a role, and it is obviously, because so many factors can play a role, very difficult to prove whether or not there has been uh, an impact, including the fact that, except for trading, full fair value accounting has been hardly applied, especially in, in the US. And if you use the circuit breakers, as, as uh, Christian mentioned, it's very difficult to see uh, whether may be, because the circuit breaker have been used, it hasn't been ha having an effect. However, I believe because the discussion about fair value or more fair value and, or full fair value keeps going, is still striving strong, I think we need to concentrate on what has the crisis been teaching us beyond the question of the empirical proof. Because the lessons about fair value has been in discussions, sometimes not uh, been taken in, the discussions have been superficial. Because if we don't le le learn from these crises, because it's obviously not just one, what fair value in the sense of market prices has to offer us, and what maybe it is not able to deliver to us, we cannot hope for proper accounting standards development. So what can market prices deliver to us? And do markets really know better? It has been argued that fair value is so important and so relevant for accounting standard setting because it represents the essential properties of market value, which is supposed to be being determined by competing market forces, which are, again, supposed to take one entity-specific view price with very different views into one eventually relevant price. As Ray Ball has clarified so convincingly, the efficient markets hypothesis never has stated that market prices reflect fundamental values, nor in particular that investors should not test any market price towards a fundamental analysis. That's not what the EMH has been saying. And this quote unquote reverse application uh, that has been used in the arguments for standard setting is in fact a misuse. It's neither intellectually nor logically sound. Now, this argument might not convince some standard setters. However, the crisis has actually shown us that the thesis itself has more limits than we previously thought. In particular, the prices for equity securities, which obviously the thesis is concentrating on, do not move only on the basis of information, number one. And they certainly do not move only on the basis of information about a specific uh, equity securities company. I would like to quote from the recent McKinsey book on value, the four cornerstones of corporate finance, as follows. The third cornerstone is that a company's performance in the stock market is driven by changes in the stock market's expectations, not just by changes in the stock market in, a, in this um, a company's actual performance. Most important, they explain that the market is moved by interactions of investors who have very different strategies and different beliefs about the future. And the interaction of investors creates volatility even if there is no new information in the market. 
The book's description of the key market forces is to me eye-opening in its clarity of two major classes of investors, both of which have influence. And the latter, which is intrinsic investors, drive ultimately the ranges of prices. Please note, ranges, not single prices. And their conclusion is most convincing uh, more. There is a natural volatility to the market even without any new information. And for our discussion, their findings culminate in the summary, short-term market movements are as much about changes in expectations as they are about actual performance. And they are also influenced by purely technical factors such as large investors selling shares to rebalance their portfolios. Now, if prices are driven in ranges and they represent the outcome of factors, many others than information about the company, then prices logically cannot be taken as an implied representation of the company's fundamental values, which is cru crucial. And obviously, that never was stated or, or, or said by the uh, efficient market hypothesis. I want to just quickly touch on the issue of liquidity um, only shortly, in the sense that the one issue where I believe all financial models in the past had a real, real problem. They have taken the liquidity as endlessly available. You calculate liquidity risk on, you know, when, when you refinance. But how do you calculate that when it's due, there's nobody there to give you any? It has been the downfall from Metallgesellschaft. It has been the downfall from LTCM because their models didn't catch liquidity problems. And this problem is actually confidence. And the disappearance of confidence evaporating very swiftly and building up very slowly. We have been heard before about the question how Federal Reserves deal with that and the nightmare of this evaporation, a bank run. Now that still is not yet dealt by the market. And last one point about markets. Can prices be representing fundamental value when they, at occasion, are just a function of computer model trading, high frequency trading, and complicated further with issues like quote stuffing or revoking orders? This only signifies that market prices and fair values are not the only answer to all valuation questions in financial reporting. On the other hand, when applied in appropriate ways, then fair value has some very important role to play. The principles for measurement basis, which should be for all companies and not just for banks, which we have been focusing a little bit on. They should be derived from what matters most to the whole issue, and that is value, and value is driven by cash flow generation. And such principles, I presume um, you are familiar with McKinsey's first and second cornerstones on value. If not, I just would like to quote, companies create value by investing capital from investors to generate future cash flows at rates of return exceeding the cost of capital. And from this follows as a corollary that anything that does not increase cash flows via improving revenues or return on capital doesn't create value. If it doesn't increase the pie, the so-called conservation of value principle. And what McKinsey has described here is the cash conversion cycle of business activities. It's cash out for non-cash resources and cash in for the sale of those resources, if you're trading, or for products and services created with the use of some resources purchased. But essential for valuation, analysis, and accounting and reporting is to understand how the business makes money, as Penman has put it. You need to know the cause of generating and increasing cash flow, which is the economic logic of an activity, its business model. The center of attention is the activity and not the assets which serve the activity as their tools. The same type of assets can serve very different activities with very different outcomes as far as cash flow and as far as valuation. But there are causal relationships between assets and the type of activity that they serve. It is the inherent logic of the applied business models. And valuation has to be performed with activity compatible values, which require focusing on how cash flows are actually generated, not what could be done with them. The remaining values at work, as I call it, have to be tested against market prices for the relevance of changes in market prices that have occurred 
which can be separated in two uh, categories, permanent and temporary changes. And here's just a summary overview of market price relevance in different cases. The dominant factor of determining measurement basis are the cash flow contributions to an activity. For cash generating activities, market values are relevant for income reporting if and only if they lead to imminent cash flows or the expectations thereof. However, in all other cases, the relevance of the disclosure of market values is dependent on the specific needs and objective of the individual users. Essentially, in these cases, investors have to judge for themselves whether or not market prices have relevance to whatever they want to assess in terms of uh, judgment on future cash flow developments. Let me just quickly close with some comments on a few issues that could be addressed when discussing the recent financial crisis and the connection with accounting standards. And one, and that's probably one that has been touched uh, about before, is the discussion around the incurred loss or expected loss methodologies for loan loss provisions. You've heard that banks claimed that they were not allowed to do loan loss provisionings. Yes, it is correct. The incurred loss philosophy goes hand in hand with a focus on single assets instead of a more holistic view of a dynamic activity. Last not least, also portfolio view. I actually would recommend for research, the research work on how many billions of loan loss reserves have been reversed in Europe when banks had to move to the new IF, IFRS, which was based on the incurred loss model from America. There were billions. I remember the discussions. So you'll find the data in, in, in around 2000. And I guess uh, instead of being distributed by way of dividends and bonuses, they would have been quite handy in the recent crisis. A second issue, maybe a little bit contentious, is what I call the contribution of standard setters to the loss in confidence by claiming that markets know better because, quote, they tell us how it is, unquote. As we know, it's just assessment of uh, expectations. Um, this is difficult to believe. And I would like to uh, call a witness, which is an article in the Financial Times of June 2009 called Signs of Life in Distressed Debt Trade. And it shows a chart of European flow loans uh, source, standard and pause, where bid prices dropped from 85% of face value in September, uh, pardon, October 2008 to 60% in January 2009, just to recover to 85% in May 2009. So I ask you, who knows better and when? Which leads to the question that has been mentioned this morning. There is, in fair value observation, a time element involved, and it's an element involved where panic or certain moods can give greater weight to some uh, inputs into modeling of future developments than others. Now, if you have a bank that wrote down in December or in January when they do the books down to the 65%, then the poor pensioner of last year, he is in the loss. And then when they write and show a profit in the next year under fair value, well, great, the traders have all of a sudden a bonus uh, claim and you have a dividend claim, even though that within the total activity, nothing has happened. And this is what people overlook when they apply for value in the wrong moment. The cash conversion cycle starts here, but it can go quite far if you don't look towards the end. And I was enlightened by the uh, comments from Betsy before what she's asking actually about future developments. If you don't look at this development, if you don't look what really happens and how the money is made, you will misjudge and you will be surprised that things don't come your way. Last but not least, I would like to point out that the crisis has been partly been caused by ignorance about the relevance of some business models. Like for instance, when the fund industry jumped into securitized loans or SUVs, SIVs, based on refunding with mismatched maturity. The securitization created instruments which gave false impression of somewhat more liquid instruments, though the underlying business and the underlying risk was and remained long term. Nothing happened. So such mismatch would have been not permitted in the banking book by regulation, at least in Europe. One last comment, transparency. In my own practice uh, in the finance function, I have witnessed the benefit 
of presenting bad news to the markets swiftly and cleanly as it happens. However, we have experienced recently what I would call the opinion bias of the markets. When markets are in padding mode, it is not advisable to present better than expectation results or arguments. Because you will be punished if you don't meet the bad news as bad as the analyst had calculated it. It is not convincing and it's very, very difficult. So one has to be careful. This is my last uh, recommendation for research. Compare over time the company's specific forecast of analysts with the outcome in the following years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. I am going to limit my comments to fair value accounting and cyclicality, in, specifically in the commercial banking industry. That's the main study I've, I've done in this area, along with my colleagues at Notre Dame, Brad Badiger and Peter Easton. So this slide depicts the, a commonly told story about how fair value accounting leads to downward spirals in the commercial banking industry. And it all starts at the top, the top box, where you have some exogenous shock to market prices. So in the context of the recent financial crisis, the, exo the exogenous shock was mortgage borrowers stopped paying their mortgages. And that led to a decline in the value of mortgage-backed securities. Okay? Then we get to the second box. The fair value provisions in US accounting rules required banks to write down the value of their securities. And then as the story goes, these write downs depleted the bank's regulatory capital. So to avoid regulatory sanctions, banks had to do something to boost their regulatory capital ratios. Okay? And they have a couple actions at their disposal, which you see over on the far right. One, they can divest themselves of assets, sell assets into the market. The other, they can cut their lending. All right? Now, either of these actions is going to have a feedback effect on market prices. If, if banks as a whole start selling securities into the market, that's going to put price, price pressure on the securities. If banks cut their lending, that's going to affect the broader economy and lead to declines in financial markets as well. So those further declines in market prices lead to a whole new round of write downs and we get caught up in a death spiral. Now there have been several studies examining various links in this chain. And Duchamp has a study examining the first link and I'll let him talk more about that. But he looks at, at the relationship between declines in market prices and the accounting write downs. I'm going to focus specifically on the second link in the chain today. I think that's the most important link, and I think that's where this story breaks down. Because it turns out that the way regulatory capital rules are written, many of the fair value write downs don't end up affecting regulatory capital. And so let's examine why that's true. Why don't these fair value write downs affect regulatory capital? Well, if you look at a bank's balance sheet, a typical commercial bank, by far, their largest asset are, is the loans they've made. Loans are not marked to market. Managers provision for bad debt expense through their own estimates, not by marking to market. Then the second biggest asset on a bank's balance sheet is typically their portfolio of available for sale and held to maturity securities. Now, available for sale securities are marked to market on the balance sheet. But it turns out those markings do not flow through and affect regulatory capital unless the write downs are deemed other than temporary. And that's the case where fair value has fallen far below amortized cost and there's very little chance that it will, that will, the value will ever recover. So then the firm designates that other than temporary and it does decrease regulatory capital. No other write downs affect regulatory capital. So really the only asset of consequence on a bank's balance sheet that does have a direct effect on regulatory capital is the trading securities. But this practice of marking trading securities to market is largely non-controversial because by designating a security as trading, that's the bank's statement that they intend to sell that security in the near term. So any illiquidity discounts embedded in that price are highly relevant to that bank and ought to be reflected on the balance sheet, ought to be reflected in regulatory capital. So Christian talked in his remarks about how for fair value accounting to have exacerbated the crisis, it had to have had some undue effect beyond the losses itself. So the only link I see as far as the assets on a bank balance sheet where fair value could have had an undue effect on the banks, on cyclicality, 
is with those other than temporary impairments in the held to maturity and available for sale portfolio. So that end, ends up being in the focus of our study. So we went out and hand collected the other than temporary impairments that banks took over a long period of time, 2004 to 2008. And you can see that during the peak year of the crisis, which was 2008, these impairments do become historically large. Okay? But one thing to note is that the markets for mortgage-backed securities, those markets started tanking in mid-2007. And it, didn't, it, it wasn't until late in 2008 that we started to get sizable other than temporary impairments. So nevertheless, it does look like the impairments got big during the crisis, but we have to ask, was the magnitude of these effects big enough to really have an effect? So the way we gauge that is we compare these impairments to the bad debt expense charges that banks were taking. Bad debt expense, as I mentioned before, is not a mark-to-market -market number. It comes from, from, a from a manager's estimate. So that's what this graph depicts. I've graphed bad debt expense, that's the gray bars. We've also graphed uh, the bank's earnings, the white bars. And then the black bars you see were the blue bars from the previous slide. So you can see how the other than temporary impairments, those blue bars from the previous slide, pale in comparison to the bad debt expense banks were taking during the crisis. Bad debt expense is a non-fair value number. OTTIs are, are the fair value number. You can also see that the other than temporary impairments are small relative to banks' normal earnings. So if low capital for banks was a problem during the crisis, the primary source of that low capital was a, was a non-mark-to-market number, bad debt expense. Now we've taken this a step further and actually quantified the effect of other than temporary impairments on the tier one capital ratio. And if you add up the impairments taken during the crisis, it turns out that on average, it only reduces the, the tier one capital ratio by about 30 basis points. Most every bank in our sample was well capitalized, even during the crisis. So 30 basis points is not enough to put a bank in danger of any kind of regulatory sanction. So the key breakdown in this story happens in that second linkage between the accounting write downs and, and, the, and uh, regulatory capital. Now some other studies have examined links beyond that over on the other side of the circle, but any identified linkage fair value could not have played a meaningful role. For example, uh, Barajas, Chami, Casamano, and Hakura, they find that banks did, in fact, cut their lending during the crisis because of low capital ratios. But we know that capital ratios were not low because of fair value accounting. They were low for other reasons. Uh, we also look at whether low capital ratios cause banks to sell securities. We find very inconsistent and weak evidence of that. And then Bot Frankel and Martin look at feedback effects between asset sales in the mortgage-backed securities market and declines in the, in the prices in those markets. Um, they do find some effects, but they are very modest economic significance. So overall conclusions. We come to the conclusion that fair value accounting did not cause downward spirals in the commercial banking industry during the crisis. But I have to end with a caveat. The reason fair value accounting didn't have much of an effect is that there wasn't much fair value accounting going on to speak of, in that these fair value write downs did not flow through and affect regulatory capital. So we can't look at the crisis as a lab test of a pure form of fair value accounting, where the write downs would affect regulatory capital. So our study and the studies I've mentioned don't necessarily support an expansion of fair value accounting. On the other hand, I think they do show that the crisis does not represent a reason to curb fair value accounting. And that's contrary to what the banking industry argued at the time and continues to argue today. Thank you. Shout. Good afternoon. Well, first of all, let me begin by, by thanking the organizers, uh, Peter and, and Trevor, for inviting me uh, to speak here. So my presentation will focus on the losses or write-downs that were recognized by financial institutions during the crisis, uh, in particular over 2007 and 2008, and whether these, uh, these losses were consistent with the devaluations, uh, at least on a relative timing basis, that were being implied by uh, widely used external benchmarks at that time, uh, credit ind indices such as the ABX index. Uh, 
So uh, let me begin with a very brief background. So financial institutions had uh, banks, insurance companies, uh, investment banks, they had large exposures to, uh, to real estate backed assets, Mor mortgage backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swaps that were written on these exposures. And during the crisis, these institutions had to recognize billions of dollars worth of write downs through a variety of uh, accounting treatments, predominantly in my sample uh, through unrealized fair value adjustments, but also through uh, OTTI charges, uh, credit loss provisioning, and uh, realized losses on settlement of positions. So how does this fit into the debate that uh, both Christian and Jeff are talking about? So on the one hand, critics were claiming that financial institutions were taking write downs that were benchmarked, uh, that were based on benchmarks that reflected uh, liquidity-related problems rather than true fundamental credit devaluations. And this, in turn, was uh, giving rise to uh, problems such as a spiral that, uh, that Christian talked about. And on the other hand, uh, some other people, uh, especially uh, if you look at some of the class action lawsuits, they were arguing that the write-downs taken by financial institutions did not reflect the uh, devaluations, the contemporary devaluations that were being implied by external benchmark indices. So for, for example, some of the popular indices that were, that were widely followed during the crisis were the ABX index, which was used uh, as a benchmark for, uh, or as a gauge for the health of subprime mortgage market conditions, and the CMBX index that was used as, as a benchmark for commercial mortgages. So the question that I, I examine is whether the write-downs taken by uh, financial institutions during the crisis, did they reflect the, uh, the price levels or devaluations that were being implied by external benchmark indices uh, at that point in time? Or in other words, were the write-downs that were taken during the crisis, were they timely? And then next, I, I, I tried to look at whether the timeliness of write-downs varied with firm characteristics, and whether these uh, timely write-downs measured in the sense that, I, that I'm just going to describe right now. Um, were they considered to be informative by the stock market? So uh, ju just as a brief note over here, you know, timeliness of accounting measurements is, is a topic which is of uh, much more broader interest to accounting academics. And the crisis, I think, provides us with a, with a rather unique opportunity to, to look at context-specific or exposure-specific uh, measures of news, such as the, uh, the credit indices that we're referencing uh, specific asset classes. For example, as I just mentioned, ABX index was used as a, as a, as a barometer for, for uh, the health of subprime mortgages, and the CMBX index was used as a benchmark for, for commercial mortgages. There were some other ind uh, indices that, that referenced some other asset classes, such as CDOs, et cetera, at least for, for, for a given point, uh, for, for, for a given while during the crisis. Yeah. So here's something that a lot of you are familiar with. You know, it's, it's, uh, the famous ABX index, which uh, which is nothing but uh, uh, but an ind index which is constructed uh, uh, using a series of uh, credit default swaps that are written on subprime mortgage-backed securities, and the price level of the ABX index, and and, and there are different tranches uh, which which indicate uh, the, uh, the the quality of uh, of different uh, initial credit ratings, ranging from AAA to triple B minus. And the price level of these indices, uh, sub-indices, uh, quickly became a gauge for the health of the subprime mor uh, mortgage market. And, and, and this was basically seen to be as, as one of the aggregate, aggregate views for, uh, for the health of um, the entire subprime mortgage market. Okay. Now, the problem really was that as we went into the crisis, and I, I have a picture over here which, uh, which is one of the lower tranches of the ABX index. During the crisis, th the price level of these indices, they really plummeted, uh, plummeted drastically. And we can witness a very dramatic fall in the price level of, 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 of the various sub-indices that, that comprise the ABX index. Okay. And this dramatic fall, th this drastic fall, led critics to argue that these, uh, the price levels of these indices uh, reflected fear and panic or liquidity related problems rather than you know, true fundamental credit devaluations. And that the write downs that were based on these indices were, uh, were excessive and they were not reflective of, of true cre uh, credit deterioration 
And there were some studies that came out of the Bank of England and, and some other papers from the BIS which, which made this claim. There were certain co counter arguments, um, for example, the, in, the, in the paper by Locks and Lloyds, which claimed that if indeed these, uh, the, if indeed the write downs that were benchmarked to these indices were, were excessive, then we should have seen a reversal across all the tranches of, of, for example, the ABX index to the levels that were seen before the crisis. And, and that is something that we haven't seen to the extent uh, that would justify claims that uh, you know, the write downs are, are, were indeed excessive. So as far as the measurement of, of the timeliness of write downs is concerned, it, it is important to, to match the write downs of different types of uh, exposures to the corresponding indices, which, uh, which reference the corresponding asset class. For example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the ABX index is, is used to reference uh, assets that were backed by subprime mortgages. Uh, CMBX index was used to, uh, to map uh, or to match the write downs put into assets that were, uh, that were backed by commercial mortgages, and so forth. So then the next step was to compute the, uh, the cumulative quarterly difference between the, the actual accounting write down and the write down that was being implied by uh, these credit indices, uh, which were referencing different asset classes. Right? And this is scaled by the total dollar amount of write down over 2007 and 2008. 2008. So the thing that I wanted to highlight here was that this measurement scheme does not challenge the total dollar amount of write-down that was taken over 2007 and 2008, but rather how this write-down was divided across these eight quarters. So the picture here shows that uh, the, the solid line is the write-down, is the write-down write schedule that was, be, that was be being implied by the credit ind indices, and the dotted line is the schedule, the actual accounting write-down schedule. So we see that for each and every interim quarter uh, from, the, from the beginning of 2007 uh, to the end of 2008, the actual accounting write-downs were lower than the corresponding write-downs that were being implied by credit index, index benchmarks. So notice that the beginning and the end point is the same. Yeah. So, so this scheme, again, does not challenge the, the total dollar amount of write-down that was taken, but rather how this was divided across the eight quarters. And then cross-sectionally, uh, the empirical evidence suggests that there were a number of factors that were, that were related to the timeliness of write-downs. So for example, financial leverage, litigation pressure, to some extent, regulatory constraints. And uh, more importantly, um, as I think uh, some of the previous panels have pointed out, there was a lot of va valuation uncertainty surrounding some of the complex positions that, that the financial institutions were exposed to during the crisis. And the empirical evidence also does suggest that uh, more complex exposures were written down later, which, which sort of implies that valuation uncertainty also played a role in the ultimate uh, write-down decision. Right. Um, all right. So in the interest of time, I'll just, just skip this table and move on to the next piece of evidence. On the other hand, uh, I, I observe that the stock market reflects the uh, exposure to risky assets on a more timely basis for firms with more timely write-downs. So, so basically, at, at the end of each uh, cumulative quarter, the cumulative quarterly st stock returns reflect a greater proportion of the total dollar amount of write-down for firms which have more timely write-downs. So in conclusion, uh, on average, I find that the, the write-downs taken by financial institutions during the crisis were not timely, at least when compared to the devaluations implied by benchmarks, some of the widely used benchmark credit indices, exposure uh, specific indices, and that the timeliness varied with, uh, with firm characteristics, and that for, for firms with more timely write downs, um, the stock market or, or the stock returns reflected a greater proportion of their exposure to risky assets at a given point in time. Now the other, other issue which, which I think is quite important and which, which is not adequately addressed, at least in in, the pres in my presentation, but, but, but something that demands, uh, demands attention, at least from, from researchers, is the issue of disclosures and, and whether disclosures of, of crisis-related positions were adequate during the crisis. And how did disclosures react with actual recognized losses to, uh, to inform market participants? And that is something which is, I think, worthy of further investigation. So thank you.
many slides, so I'm going to stay here. Um, I want to begin by concurring with the, my fellow panelists on a few points. Um, one is I think fair value accounting had virtually nothing to do with the financial crisis for the reasons that Jeff referred to. Um, I want to just make a couple addendums or maybe semantic points. Um, one is I think Jeff's results are actually understated because in my opinion, based on much of my research throughout my career, banks are uh, counter cyclical in the way they reserve for loan losses. They over reserve in good times and then they reserve the minimum possible, which basically means a ratio of the allowance for loan losses to loan charge offs of one during bad times. And so if anything, his results are much stronger. It's bad debts that expense on the loan portfolio, which is 60% of assets that drives um, the, the effects. Um, in, in some uh, places, you'll see uh, this is a defense of fair value accounting. It didn't cause the crisis because it's not applied um, very much. I think that's uh, not the way I would <laughs> um, try to justify fair value accounting. I think there's actually good offensive <laughs> arguments to uh, that fair value accounting can actually make things better, and I'll try to make them uh, a little bit later. Um, another thing is uh, under FAS 157, as written, and certainly as interpreted by uh, FSP FAS 157.4, uh, fair value reflects an orderly transaction. It does not, if markets are disorderly, it does not reflect a market value. And I wouldn't call, uh, I wouldn't say that FAS 157 has circuit breakers. Uh, that sort of suggests that when markets are illiquid, we go into some sort of special case. I would flip it around and say the special case is liquid markets. That actually occurs for virtually none of banks' loan portfolio, banks' assets, even in the best of markets. This, the, 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 the normal case is a certain degree of illiquidity in positions. And fair value is the right way to think uh, when you have illiquid positions. You know, if there were an orderly transaction or something like an orderly transaction, what would the, um, the asset be sold for? Okay, so now I'm going to sort of shift to offense in a couple of phases. Um, first, I think it's absolutely clear, uh, and Stern School's written a few books on this point, that the financial crisis was caused by banks, especially, but also other financial institutions, originating and retaining concentrated exposures to credit risky, opaque, and potentially illiquid assets, um, while holding insufficient capital and insufficient liquidity. Um, it seems to me if we're going to prevent future crises, the primary way to do so is to prevent such concentrated positions from being held at all, or if they are held, to make sure there's adequate capital, adequate liquidity. Particularly true at banks, because the salient feature of financial crises is the banking system is involved. In normal markets, the banking system is either the primary source of liquidity or the primary backup source of liquidity. And if the banking system can't provide that liquidity, things get ugly pretty fast. Um, so once you sort of think that way, I think you can think of fair value accounting as part of the solution, I think actually a s relatively small part, not part of the problem. And so why is it a part of the solution? Because once you have to estimate fair value, then you have to question your valuations. You have to think, is my model right? Is, are my assumptions right? Uh, what's missing? Um, you know. If I took out this piece of the model, as some of the prior speakers said, wh what would happen? Um, it requires attention from preparers of financial statements, auditors of financial statements. It should require attention from bank regulators. And I think if there's anything that caused the crisis, it's that bank regulators took too much for granted. Accounting valuations, value at risk measures, bank risk management generally, and they let banks roll with these concentrated, undercapitalized, illiquid positions. Um, but again, I think, I think fair value accounting is just sort of a, a small part of the solution. The, the, the main part of the solution is better risk management. Um, you know, we can't, we can't stop with value at risk based on, you know, the last one year of historical data, because that's always going to be understated in good times. And as soon as times turn ugly, the value at risk measures become irrelevant. And so, I mean, the way I think of it is we start with fair value accounting, then we add something like a model like value at risk or expected loss. Then we stress test the model based on what we could possibly envision as to uh, bad outcomes. And then we realize the world's an ambiguous place. 
the future bad outcomes are probably not going to look like the, the historical bad outcomes. And then we've got to go qualitative, gut feel, whatever it is. Um, uh, Annette could say better than, than me. Um, so now I want to turn a little bit to, to research, because research is, I think, is actually sort of bought into this idea that uh, fair value accounting is either part of the problem or potentially part of the problem. Uh, and it hasn't really uh, at all addressed the possibility that fair value accounting could be a at least a partial solution to the problem. Um, and so I think there's a certain number of assumptions or ceteris paribus uh, state, you know, beliefs that are built into the research. Uh, one belief, I think, is that prior to the crisis, you started out at the same positions, the same credit risk, the same illiquidity risk, the same capital, the same uh, liquidity, whether we're doing fair value accounting or we're doing cost-based accounting. That seems to me to be an untenable assumption. If you're thinking about your positions, you're going to start out at different places, and if you're paying attention, you're going to manage the positions better at the beginning of crises, when the cracks start appearing in the walls, you're not going to wait until the crises hit you full smack in the face. Um, another assumption is that, is that bank capital requirements are inflexible, that they're 5 percent or some other number, it's the same in good times as in bad times, and that bank capital reg regulation is not the first primary way to deal with systemic risk. Um, it seems to me transparently the case that if you believe banks in good times are accumulating too much risk, uh, then you should jack up capital requirements in some fashion. And if you believe that banks are not lending in bad times because they, they feel in danger of being undercapitalized, then I don't necessarily uh, recommend this, but maybe bank regulators should think about lowering capital requirements for some period of time um, or injecting capital in, in some fashion. Um, similarly, I think if you think gaps being used in contracts, contracts are assumed to be inflexible. Um, another thing that often not uh, focused on is liabilities. Liabilities can be fair valued too. In fact, if you want to be counter cyclical, only fair value the liabilities, don't fair value the assets. So it's not fair value accounting, it's what you fair value. I personally favor fair valuation of the whole portfolio, both assets and liabilities, because that's where you get to see the interconnections of between positions. If there's duration matching or any other form of risk management, that'll show up. Um, a lot of the research will also ignore the fact that you can issue equity in some fashion, or you can have contingent equity in some fashion. Um, and I, I, I'm a strong proponent that <coughs> banks should have debt convertible to equity or preferred convertible to e uh, c common, something like that, to try to mitigate uh, solvency and liquidity issues. Um, an another assumption, I think, is that banks tend to sell illiquid assets uh, rather than liquid assets during crises. Uh, I think, there's, as Jeff showed, there's very little evidence of that. Um, if you try to sell an illiquid asset, you're going to take a, a fairly large loss, typically. Um, and if banks do sell illiquid assets, I don't think it has anything to do with fair value accounting. It has to do with wanting to get rid of taint in your portfolio. It has to do with a race to the exits, to be the first to sell rather than the last to sell. And that's going to exist whether there's fair value accounting or not. Um, uh, sort of moving, uh, still research, but sort of a different, um, a different take. It seems to me there's two construct validity problems that researchers have to deal with. Uh, one is we really don't know much about banks' exposures. We sort of know types. We know they got these kinds of loans. We got they got the kinds of securities, but we really don't know how risky they are. And I love Dushian's paper. He, I was his referee, as he knows. Um, I think it's the best paper written on the financial crisis, and he does a absolutely valiant attempt to try to match banks' exposures to available information about indices. Um, but there's always going to be the inference problem, which is that uh, if it looks like the write-down is slow, it may be because the position's less risky than you think. And if it looks like the write-down is fast, it may be because the position's riskier than you think. Uh, or it could be that the index is illiquid and therefore there's a problem in the index. Um, you know, I, I think I, it's actually hard for me to imagine how you could do Dushian's paper better than he did because it's really a valiant job. But, you know, if, if we could, that would be great. If we could think about these uh, um, ability to understand the exposure better. Um, 
And an, another, uh, which Arouge, Arouge's paper deals with contagion. And what uh, Arouge shows is that um, as we go through time and as there's more fair value accounting, that there's a more of a correlation between uh, big banks returns and small banks returns or the banking systems returns as a whole. And he interprets that as being attributable to fair value accounting. Um, I would not. <laughs> there's a lot going on through time uh, that affects the banking industry. Uh, one thing is that banks got out of the lending business and more into the contingent lending business. They wrote loan commitments, backup financing rather than funded financing. That means they've got off balance sheet exposures. Those off balance sheet exposures are really going to get triggered when you hit crises um, at exactly the wrong time. And so that's one thing that goes on. Another thing that's going on is value at risk. Banks started using these risk management tools based on historical data, started, you know, early 90s and sort of developed through time. Um, uh, securitizations particularly risky asset securitization started in the early 90s, developed through time. There's a whole lot of stuff going on through time. It's correlated with the expansion of fair value accounting, and actually, in my opinion, it's first order importance compared to fair value accounting. Um, am, I, am I done? Okay. Um, just one, one small thing is I, I do think, I'm not a fair value accounting zealot in the sense that I think there are alternative measures that are less sensitive to liquidity that are informationally rich in much the same way as fair value accounting is. And we should maybe uh, consider either them in addition to fair value accounting through disclosures or, in, or maybe as a substitute. Okay. Very good. Um, so I think we've left plenty of time for uh, audience discussion. So um, I don't know whether there are any uh, immediate reactions, questions. Again, we have mics. Uh, I saw Scott and Phil. And then was that Mark? Yeah. If I was a bank regulator, um, what would I ask banks? What kind of information would I ask banks? Um, so let me just describe bank regulation a little bit. There's sort of two types of regulation. There's regulation of the biggest banks, which is regulation on faith. They use banks' own internal risk models to determine how much capital the bank should hold. And they really have very little ability to penetrate either the bank's exposures or the bank's models. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of regulation on faith. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to, to really know how you could do it better because they've got this term large complex banking organizations and, you know, what it basically means is just too hard to understand. Uh, one of the reasons I, I, I don't like too big to fail is too big to fail also typically means too complicated to fail. Um, so, you know, I, I, I favor a simpler banking system generally. Um, I don't think size is the particular issue, I, I think it's, 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 it's simplicity. Um, once you get out of the big banks, then I think actually bank regulators can understand their portfolios pretty well, uh, probably as well as the bank can. Uh, and there, you know, I think you just make sure that they um, hold sufficient capital given their risks. And I think one of the things bank regulators should be able to do better than anybody else in the world is figure out, figure out when pressures are building up in the banking system as a whole that requires banks as a whole to, 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 to uh, uh, hold more capital. Um, I think uh, under, underwriting data, for example, they should have been able to realize that banks had uh, started writing lower FICO scores, more risk layering, uh, uh, doing securitizations where there were, was a uh, strong possibility that either contractual recourse or moral recourse would be in play. You know, I think there's definitely questions they could ask to try to assess individual banks' risks, but more importantly, the risk of a banking system as a whole and sort of a building up of sort of excessive uh, extension of credit and concentrated positions and positions that are likely to go south altogether. So uh, just as a follow-up, do you think that the systemic risk panels that we're setting up I, uh, the, in the U.S. has a different name, but it's like the same idea? Do you think they, they're going to be able to do that job? I mean, that's sort of the idea behind these right. panels, right? It, it is the idea, but my sense these panels are very high-level panels. I, I think you need people that are 
in, in the trenches um, to, to be you know, doing yeah. this kind of work and um, maybe the quality of bank regulators, the skill set you know, has, has to get ratcheted up. Um, but I, I'm not an expert on the, re the regulatory proposals. Okay. I think Phil was next. Thanks. This a quick question. So I think I'm remembering a fact correctly. If I'm not, if I'm not, you guys can can correct me. But I I was convinced by the reasoning of why fair value accounting probably did not play a role in the crisis and therefore a role in some of the problems the banks had. But my recollection of the following is: in March of '09, wasn't there sort of a relaxation, if you want to call it that, of fair value accounting in the U.S. and weren't all the major bank stocks bumping up by a pretty considerable amount on the day that news broke? So if that didn't represent the idea that fair value accounting had been causing a problem, you know, and now there's less of that problem, did it represent something else? I guess I'm just asking for speculation on why were those bank stock prices jumping up on that day, basically? It was impairment. It was impairment. Fixed impairment? Fixed impairment. They, fixed, they, they changed impairment. In what sense? And by the time that was logged here, you know, call it that. No, but I mean, that, no. <laughs> What problem did that solve then? Well, here we go. The, the, the major change was to allow the banks to only have to take a write down through income for the, their estimate of the credit loss portion of the fair value change. Now that had an effect on regulatory capital as described before. Uh, and that may have had an, an effect, but at the same time, remember the, the stress tests were going on by the federal, by the bank regulators right around that time to try to, you know, provide some ass assurance that the whole thing was not going to collapse and, and the like. So, you know, I, uh, as much as I, we'd love to take credit for that <laughs> change in, in, in the bull market and everything that we've seen since then, I don't, I, you know, maybe I can get a 20% carry on that, but I don't think so. <laughs> but I think the regulatory capital issue may have had some, some real impact because, you know, if you're, if you're a, a, a long investor in a bank uh, and if the regulatory capital gets charged more, they have to raise more capital, you get diluted, you know, that kind of effect. I think Mark was next, and then uh, Trevor. So I just had a couple questions for Steve. First one actually was I was. Mike is still not working. Oh, is it working? Oh, there we go. Sorry. No, it is. Um, the first one was you sort of trailed off at the end of your, or tailed off at the end of your conversation about uh, these measures that weren't market values but might be useful in the same way as market values. And the second thing I was <coughs> curious about, and I was going to ask Betsy this, and then I didn't get the chance to ask the question, so maybe I'll try it with Steve. And that is coming out of the crisis, and having followed these banks for a long time, and, and sort of we have this notion that we know a lot about what's going on inside of a business, even without access to you know a lot of financial reporting information. So, what things surprised you the most coming out of the crisis, in terms of what had been going on, right? In the sense, like Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you find out who's swimming naked. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about what things really surprised you to learn after the fact about what the banks were doing. Okay, um, <laughs> can I take the first one first? That's easier. Um, you know, the, the alternative measures I would use would be, uh, I, I believe that one should take expected, something like expected cash flows in the numerator, and in the denominator you should take, use current rates insofar as it pertains to riskless interest rates and credit risk premium. And then the question is what do you do with illiquidity premium? to the extent that you can separate them from credit risk premium. Um, and I think of fair value accounting as taking sort of a middle road, which, which is it imagines a hypothetical orderly transaction occurring in illiquid markets. Um, I always think Warren Buffett coming in and buying GE and Goldman Sachs preferred stock uh, during the crisis, orderly transaction. He negotiates good terms because he, w he's willing to engage in a transaction when a lot of people aren't. Um, and so, I, you know, Fair value is not a fire sale value, but it does include some illiquidity premium that's attributable to an orderly transaction. Um, but you could imagine alternative measures that were um, 
you know, for example, that ignored the illiquidity premium risk altogether. I call that what I call it fulfillment value, which is imagine the firm was able to hold the position through either to maturity at the latest, but possibly recovery of market liquidity. Uh, that would be the expected cash flows discounted at the, you know, riskless rate plus the credit risk <coughs> premium, but not the illiquidity premium. Um, you know, it seems to me one of the things the literature as a whole hasn't gotten at is the idea that liquidity risk is different from all other risks because it pertains to market breakdown. And so if you can hold a position until the liquidity horizon, whenever that is, uh, then it's worth more to you than if you have to sell it. And it seems to me accounting and disclosure generally has to convey that there's multiple values that exist in um, illiquid markets. And fair value is a sensible one, but it's not the only sensible one. Um, so then, you know, what did I, I you know, um, you know, I could see that lending during pre-crisis was, you know, building up risks. Um, but, you know, I look at a few banks here and there, and I follow the same banks over and over. And, you know, the concentration of risks, where everybody was writing the same, uh, the same risks, and the extent to which the loan extension was undisciplined um, in terms of, you know, documentation of mortgages and other things, uh, you know, you can't see that unless you're inside, which means you're either the, pre the preparer or you're the bank regulator. Uh, so, you know, all of the nasty stuff that came out about those things, I mean, that, that, it all surprised me. Um, you know, and, I, you know and, then, and then, of course, you know, AI, firms like AIG that had these massive concentrations of risk that you just, you, nobody knew about, even informed investors didn't know about to fully. I mean, that, that was a nasty surprise. Okay, so I, I have Trevor next. So I, I have a bunch of different things um, for different people, but uh, one thing I do want to just start off by saying is this discussion about liquidity and capital, and particularly capital requirements, is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And what, what I find striking in a number of different places today is we talk about the need for this, but how we actually get to that and what that number should be is a remarkably hard exercise, which hopefully we'll have some discussion with tomorrow. But what, what I wanted to uh, just mention actually for Jeff's paper and, and Peter's paper is I, I think that you've got to be a bit careful uh, when you conclude that the, the uh, and Steve alluded to this too, I guess, is that the bad debt expense has nothing to do with fair value and fair value write downs. And, and the reason for that is, or fair value adjustments, and the reason for that is because uh, as Galbraith <coughs> sort of alluded to a little bit this morning is there's a lot of interaction in the banks and all the counterparties. So there's a lot of stuff going on in people lending to each other that has nothing to do with the explicit loan that you're looking at or, or the, there are a lot of these counterparties who take, who take get credit losses because of the fair value write downs and the sales and everything on going around. So it's a very interconnected system that tends to feed on itself. And it's very difficult as, as Steve knows to actually find that in anything that's in the, in the public domain. So that, that's one, and I'm gonna give you a specific example. Fannie and Freddie were very, very big players in that market who are in a fair value accounting system all the way up and certainly all the way down. And those credit risks that they themselves were writing off as well, but they were participating in this whole fair value, let's call it morass, and everybody was connected to them. So it's, Clearly, the taking on of credit risk around some risky and, uh, and, and uncertainty, but I wouldn't be make those distinctions quite as clearly as, as you're making. But the question that I really want to uh, raise to, to many of you is, wh one of the issues about fair value, and I, and, and I was very intrigued by Steve's comments, is the regulators have taken an exit value perspective. And what I heard Steve saying is what I would, what we generally call value and use in some ways. And that in many ways there is a question of whether something that's out in a market is necessarily the best reflection. And I think if you to back what Andreas was talking about, is maybe there's something in there that is a value to the business that is not, and, and we used to call that, for those of us who are old enough, replacement cost accounting. 
Okay, so there, there are other ways to get to a adjustment to historical cost that's not actually an exit value in a market price. And maybe that's where we could learn a little bit about some, some of these kinds of issues. I don't know if you have a view on it. Especially when you talk about valuing, fair valuing liabilities. If you're going to be replacing a loan as opposed to just doing an exit value of loan, you get a very different perspective on how much value you've so-called created at that point in time. Do you want to move by or anybody else on the panel? Sure, I'll, I'll take on the uh, value and use, I think is a good concept outside of a banking setting. But the problem with, with value and use for a bank, especially a bank that's financed with short-term liabilities, is that the creditors likely are not going to be placated by value and use. They're, they're worried about what, what, the, what the asset side of the balance sheet is worth today and are they covered. So that's, I mean, that's one, one distinction between a banking setting and maybe some others. I would just, to just a quick retort on that. If, if you look at, let's take Wells Fargo um, or any of these banks, their largest long, as they do their disclosures, the largest long-term indefinite liability is core deposits. And the FASB at one point in time wanted to capitalize all these and mark these to market. So I agree in principle, and that's the bank run that people are talking about. But again, this asset liability matching question is a whole interesting aspect to this, to this issue. Anybody else? Yeah, Andreas. I, I just, uh, even though I'm not an expert on the American market, I, I hear constantly you know, that banks give long-term loans and then refinance them short-term. Uh, I'm un uncertain whether they are really allowed to do that. At least on the continental market, you have a mismatch of responsibility and there are limits to what you can do, and I think Barr gives some ideas about that as well. So you mentioned the core deposits. I think there, there is a big function of just avoiding that. So I don't think that, um, I actually agree with you that uh, whether you call it value in use or value at work or remaining value, um, uh, that is not a bad idea. Um, my, my concern is what, what Stephen said. I, I, I have my doubts that I can, can agree with much of it because um, it sounds like fair value is really the solution to everything. You just have to do it right. And this is a very strange thought to me because basically we're looking here at value, uh, fair value minimum at level two, providing you use the right inputs. And then we have some inputs that we obviously don't get right, like liquidity risk. Now, if I look at this value discussion, then I don't see conceptually any difference between a fair value correctly for credit risk and the so-called proper uh, uh, loan loss provisions on the classical side. That is not a question between fair value and, and historical cost. It's a question of whether you do judge your credit risk right. And that's, that's about it. And uh, that the fact that, as I heard this afternoon, the whole market knew that all these mortgages were, were bad and the whole market knew that they wouldn't be able to pay back, then under a proper loan loss provision, you would have to start provisioning when the first house sank in their price because you wouldn't recover the loan you ha had been on. And you would have to have a margin that you wouldn't be able to do that. But of course, if you give lending to houses on the boom up uh, because the guys uh, think they can sell it again with 150% of it, I mean, that is you know, writing off wh when you put it out. And that's where you have a problem if you think of an incurred loss uh, uh, system where unless someone stops paying, you don't really need to do much in, in initially. But that's not a question of fair value. That's a question of proper judgment of credit risk. <coughs> I just want to add one uh, remark also on this sort of notion that uh, to what extent we, we just need to get fair value accounting right. I think there's sort of, there's some really thorny sort of implementation issues, even though sort of we've written a paper that also comes out and says we don't think that fair value is a major contributor. One area where I do think fair value accounting caused problems, but it's not clear that the rules were the problem, is for instance, a lot of the banks had very complex securities. And during the crisis, the banks were relying on dealer sheets and dealer quotes for these very complex securities. So they didn't have the capabilities, they didn't have the technology to value these necessarily, and they were taking the dealer quotes. Once the market dried up, the dealer quotes came in non-binding and oftentimes with very ridiculous prices. At that point, a lot of the banks had the issue of like, what are we going to do now? They knew that the dealer quotes weren't what they could be using. The FASB and the SEC came out and told them you can deviate from the dealer quotes, but in order to deviate, you needed to have something that you could get past your auditor, right? And that something needed to be a model or of some sort. And I think there, that, that is an issue of implementation that is very thorny that I don't think we've come 
uh, to grips with, and I'd be curious if anybody has a reaction to that. Bob has a reaction to it, and maybe somebody on the panel. I think you're absolutely right. My, that's what happened. And we had to several times kind of basically tell people that, okay, you got to go do some analysis to project the cash flows and figure out a discount rate, do, do your best. But it, there were trillions of dollars of these, of these assets all over the place. Some people didn't even know for months what they had, some institutions. Uh, uh, so that was a real problem. But to me, in thinking through the issue, the issue then to me is construct better markets. So the markets for asset-backed securities, OTC derivatives, that's the main target of Dodd-Frank. I don't agree with everything of Dodd-Frank, but yeah, I don't, I don't think you can, to me, one of the lessons of the financial crisis was you cannot, we cannot allow there to be created trillion dollar markets that have no basic plumbing underneath them. <laughs> and no, you know, no, no, no price discovery, no clearing, no, no nothing. And so when the, the, the music stopped, nobody, like you said, nobody knew what to do. Uh, you know, there were a few people who had the, who had the capabilities to, to go into a complex CDO or CDO squared and model it all out. But it was, it, you know, you needed like a Cray computer to do some of that without kind of the standardized data. Okay, very good. I think we had one on the, Alistair, um, and then we have here on the left. We need to turn this room around in an hour okay. for dinner, so we'll have to, who do you want? Uh, out, then Alistair was next, and then, uh, but I guess if, we're, if we have time for only one, then he's next. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I thought it was Sorry? I thought it was okay. So he's, he's declined, then you're next. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, just a quick comment. Uh, the, the fair value economy has tremendous uh, impact on the uh, risk management discipline for the banks. Out of uh, my working experience with of many banks, uh, credit portfolio management of their loan book, and just for, the, for those who actually read some of the financial press of Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse, Actually, they were very public about the positive impact of, of the fair value accounting market, market on their risk management business. And for the loan book, another example is uh, Deutsche Bank of the loan exposure group. And th th this is not less public, but you can get information from, uh, from your money, from risk management things. So that's, a, that's one comment. Now, a question for, for the panelists. If you ca can you speak to, to that effect, so the market discipline uh, benefit of fair value uh, accounting? Is there any research uh, in this area? I think that's a. Anybody want to take it, Shant? You want well, not, not directly related to your question, but at least some of the evidence that I have in my paper suggests that uh, the stock market did uh, view the write downs that were that were closer uh, to uh, to the devaluations that were being implied by you know these benchmark credit indices to be informative. So one could think of that as. Uh, as some evidence that you know, th th there is some sort of I, uh, no, I, I don't think there is. The, I think the question is a, is a great question, which is in essence, you know, we've talked a lot about did it hurt, but we didn't, you know, talk much about or we had, you know, is there evidence that it actually helped? And I think this is what Stephen was alluding to in his comments, is that I, I don't think we have much evidence that it actually helped. Now that's hard to produce. Um, but I think there, there, there is the issue also that, that Stephen was pointing out that in these situations when the markets get dry up, the, the, the reliability and, uh, of the measurement gets much worse. And so in that regard, it's not obvious, I think, that fair value actually was a great help in the crisis. And I think some simple disclosures just on the exposures, just the roster of assets of the banks would have probably been a major help in the crisis rather than the valuation per se. Actually, just on that point, we totally agree. I mean, I, at Moody's King, we actually have doing a lot of research on this, just simple uh, exposures uh, by asset classes, by risk, pro risk profiles, would, would be tremendously helpful. Uh, and and this, as this is one point actually echoed in last session by Betsy as well. But somehow, uh, those information are not readily available to, 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 to investors. Okay, fortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your comments. Thanks for being here.